and uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mike Raker, who will uh, be presiding over our panel uh, today. So, so Mike, uh, take it away. Okay, looks like these things work, so hopefully you can hear me. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Raker. I'm a senior technical advisor for the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, and most of the work I've been doing is is around the energy water nexus and so this is a really it's been a great day so far i think one of the things that i really appreciate is the fact that we've gotten to hear a lot about the region because um, that was one of the things uh, the under secretary Richardson said this morning was she wanted to hear from, from the region we've heard some things we're going to hear some more because we have a really good expert panel up here we're going to talk a little bit more about regional things and then uh, okay and uh, then, we'll, then we're going to open it up for, for Q&A. So let me walk through, oops, yeah, let me walk through some things as, as we try to frame up what the energy water nexus is all about. Um, you heard a lot about it this morning, and this particular slide that you see up there uh, is, is uh, courtesy of uh, USGS. It's a really interesting, it's a really interesting view because it does several things for us. It helps to really tee up what's happening or, or the types of things that are in a region that are going to be impacted by energy and water. And so you can see on the slide up there you've got everything from industry, you've got agriculture, you've got, you've got commercial, you've got residential, you've got energy production distribution, you've got water and water treatment and wastewater treatment, all within community or your region and so this is a really good depiction of a typical you know any typical watershed or any typical region um, that we can think of and as we heard this morning especially from several of the regional talks about how how the region how this particular region the four corners area has very specific challenges that people are trying to work together to meet and so you know this is you know the four corners is one of many regions in the u.s and so uh, each region is going to have different challenges different problems and so we really need to understand from those regions what those problems are and, and that's kind of the way we're starting to view things at least in the department of energy in this space um, one of the things as you can see from that slide there's a lot of things going on in that region and to try to understand all those intersections, especially from the energy and water perspective, is, is really challenging. And, and it, it's not an easy task, especially in light of things like climate change and what's happening, what we're starting to observe out there. So, you know, as we start to think about this, we recognize that it's very complicated, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's things that we need to do in order to start to, to think about those challenges and how we might solve them. So meetings like today with you all and having these students here is, is kind of a start and, and we want it to continue and, and this is just the beginning. So one of the things I also want to bring up, and this is a really simple slide for a very complex issue. <laughs> you know, we talk about energy, water nexus, you know, we use energy for water and we use water for energy. And, and you can see the examples there, whether it be extraction, processing, you know, power generation, or on the other side, processing, treatment, and, 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 th and things like that. The, the, the point is, these things are very, very intricately, they're, 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 very, they're very related. And you can't do one thing without impacting the other. And as we look at climate, it starts to really cause some additional perturbations that maybe we didn't think about before or we didn't think about hard enough before. So as we start to think about, you know, we've heard some examples this morning and as we begin to think, you know, there's other examples, you know, some real simple ones that I can provide you that are even outside this region, for example, in the Tennessee Valley, um, the Tennessee River, there's, a, there's several nuclear power plants along that river. There's also a number of other thermal plants on that river. And as the water temperature is rising, it's starting to get to the point where they're impacting operations or their ability to actually produce power or produce other things that are being produced by, by things along that river. And so, it's, again, it's a result. There's things happening, and these things are really, really interrelated. And so we want to be really mindful about 
how these things engage and how they interact. So we want to try to get at a little bit of that today. And so what we're going to do um, this, this, this afternoon, you can see we've gotten, you know, we've gotten some basic subject areas up there that the, these panelists have expertise on. And they're going to be giving you some flash talks. We're talking like up to 10 minutes. And then, um, you know, after that, what we're going to do, we're going to take a quick break, and then we were going to, we're going to open it up for questions and kind of a panel session discussion. I've got a number of canned questions that I'm, I'm prepared to, to moderate for these guys. But I also, I really want the students in the room, I really want you all to think, listen to what these guys are saying and listen and remember what you heard this morning. And I really want to hear from the students. And so we have a microphone up here in the center of the room. And so when we do the q and A, I I would like to see some students come up with some questions for the panelists. And the way we're going to handle the questions is that, you know, it's going to be very informal and we're not really going to specifically go, you know, one person or another up here on the panel for a question. You know, we're going to let them all, any of them that want to respond to that, respond and even engage in a, in a bit of a discussion. So that's kind of how we're going to work things today. So with that, I hope you're all awake and you got food, got some energy, hopefully you don't fall asleep. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll blame the panelists if you fall asleep. I'm not going to blame myself. But um, we'll go ahead and get started. And because each one of them um, have a few sets, a few slides, we're, we're going to do that in, in, in the order. So first off, we're going to have uh, John Byron from PESCO uh, provide his opening remarks. So, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Hopefully I can keep you awake, at least for 10 minutes, because then I'm done. <laughs> um, but, so I work for Process Equipment and Service Company known as PASCO here in Farmington. Uh, we've been here for over 50 years, main manufacture process equipment. Most all of everything that we may make is for the oil and gas industry. But another hat that I have on is I'm on the, the board of directors for the economic development group called 4CED, Four Corners Economic Development. Been part of that for about 10 years and um, definitely it's been a challenge in this community since really when the crash hit in 2009, 2010, when the, the price of natural gas crashed um, we lost a lot of jobs and, and this community has really struggled to recover. So we've been kind of in a transitional as a community dealing with that in addition to, um, you know, so the oil and gas industry really was suppressed. It's starting to come back a little bit now, but then we just lost one of our coal-fired power plants. So a lot of impact on local jobs and the health of the community. I'm also on the board of directors for, Farm, or for San Juan Regional Medical Center and we can see the effect of the community of, of lack, lack of jobs and, and economic health um, there too. I think we're up to 80% of our, of, of our um, patients now have some sort of government funded health care, which is a sign that there's a lot of people that don't have just normal employment. So, um, so I guess I come at this from the perspective of a community looking for transition and looking for the, what we're going to be doing going forward uh, to keep this place a, 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 a healthy place to live and a place that we all want to raise our kids. So that is the, that's kind of the intro. I'm going to be talking about hydrogen. PESCO um, actually has background in that, that we're working with a company called Process, or sorry, um, Biotech out of Albuquerque to build um, one of the first hydrogen modular hydrogen um, generators here. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But just with that awareness and kind of the community and my background in oil and gas, I've got a few things just want to point out as far as what I see for hydrocarbon or for hydrogen in our community. Whoops. Sorry, now I'm caught up. So that's, that's how you spell my name if you want to know. The next thing is the geology. So one of the things, one way you can make hydrogen is through steam methane reforming. Steam methane reforming uh, uses, consumes water in the form of steam and then methane. And methane is natural gas. And we have a, uh, an abundance of natural gas here in the San Juan Basin. So the, the red dots are over 40,000 wells that have been drilled. 
Here, um, there was one point, I think, in the 1980s that we were producing 10% of the nation's natural gas here out of the San Juan Basin. So it's a, it was a world class. It's dropped quite a bit um, with the price of natural gas dropping. But there's actually a new development um, where we have, we've now got uh, the Mancus shale play that has started up. So you can see that we've done about 40, 54 TCF of gas that's trillion cubic feet of natural gas that's been produced out of the different formations here. There's estimates a local oil and gas company or their geologists have done analysis. Marion Oil and Gas, um, which by the way, they this room is named after Marion Oil and Gas, so they're, they've done a, a lot of contribution to the community. Uh, but anyway, the, they estimate that we've got 100 TCF, 100 trillion cubic feet of gas to pull out of the the, um, the Manca shale play alone. So it's with this new play coming online, these new wells have been drilled and they are world-class wells. Um, as good as, as, as any around the, the world as far as what they're getting. So that is a, more gas than we produced since the 1920s when the first wells were drilled here. So tremendous amount of natural gas that, that could be one of the feed sources to generating hydrogen here locally. The, the next thing is electrical generation. The other way you, make, you generate, elect, uh, another way to make hydrogen is through electrolysis and just taking water directly with electricity and generating hydrogen. Um, and we have a lot of electrical generation capacity here as well as transmission. Um, so right now we have, a, I think we're running around 500 megawatts or somebody may know that if it's a little bit lower here at the Navajo Generating Station, as I mentioned, we have lost our San Juan, um, uh, the, the San Juan plant has been shut down, but we still have our Navajo generating station operated by Arizona Public Service. Um, and then we also have uh, a number of projects that are being looking at for potential solar um, power generation. So that's another one. We've got uh, over, well, well over 100 megawatts that are potentially here, maybe hundreds of megawatts of solar power generation. So you look at the area, we do have power um, generation capacity as well as um, the, the power lines coming in and out of the area. So we could generate hydrogen here, even with that power coming in, that, that might be solar power or wind power from, from other areas. And I would make the point here too that with carbon sequestration, our coal plant can also be another source of clean energy. So this is a map of talking about the reservoirs and talking about carbon sequestration. So with steam methane reforming or coal-fired power generation, the way to, to make that clean is to go, uh, is to have carbon sequestration, carbon capture and sequestration. One of the things you need is you need the reservoirs. And it was, it was previously spoken about, but um, the uh, New Mexico State working with the, in the Carbon Safe Project is actually, sorry, New Mexico Tech, sorry Bob. New Mexico Tech um, just finished drilling a test well here in the northern part of the basin to characterize those, those reservoirs and to show that it's uh, truly viable. So, it, and, and that, as I said, that was already spoken about, but that's another kind of checkbox here for having clean energy and clean hydrogen. So the, other, the next thing would be kind of the use of it. Well, what can we do here where we can use hydrogen? I think the biggest opportunity for hydrogen really is replacing more of the fossil fuels on the transportation side. And so if you look, our area is, um, is a, uh, a, a basically a kind of central area for transportation between Albuquerque, Salt Lake, Phoenix, Denver. Even though we don't have interstates through here, we still have a lot of truck traffic. And of course, our own local truck traffic, everything that we're partaking here for the most part, whether it's food or fuel or whatever else, comes in and out of here on trucks. So if we can generate hydrogen and uh, have those either be the hydrogen-fueled reciprocating engines or hydrogen fuel cells, those would be areas that we could be um, replacing. And in addition, we've got the, the Nappy Farm, which has a, is a large industrial operation as well as mines in the area, so there's other Potential and finally, we have natural gas pipelines. We we are a huge we are a huge natural gas producer. 
natural gas pipelines leave here, they go to Albuquerque, they, they go to California, they go to Seattle, and that could be another opportunity where we could actually be generating hydrogen and blending it with the methane and sending it to market. The picture in the upper, upper right is actually a, a, a conceptual drawing of an industrial fueling station for biotech, where trucks would come in, fuel up, and even more transportation for hydrogen. So the, the next area where I think we, we can check a box is in manufacturing. So as I mentioned, PESCO, the company I work for, um, we're actually manufacturing, uh, this is the picture in the upper right, is the first commercial unit that we're about to ship to, um, to St. Louis. That unit um, and we'll, that will make approximately a little under one ton or a thousand kilograms of hydrogen per day. Um, and we're manufacturing that right here with our, our workforce of 480 employees. About 70% of our employees are Native American and most actually are, are Navajo. So that is uh, the product that's made right here to generate hydrogen. And those units can go anywhere where you have a, um, a commercial supply of natural gas and water and then electricity to run the unit. Another area that is the potential, which is this nexus that we're here about, is we're, we're partnering with New Mexico Tech to, um, to commercialize their water filtration technology. So that picture in the lower left is actually the prototype unit that we've been built, that we built, that hopefully will be going out to the field for testing where we are, we're looking to um, show that produced water out of oil and gas wells can actually be treated and cleaned up for other beneficial use. And one of those beneficial uses that this product could, could um, be well suited for is, is feeding hydrogen, um, feeding water to the hydrogen production. So these are three different projects that are part of the, the um, um, help me out, the hydrogen hub application for the four states. So the Nappy Hub project, which is looking at generating hydrogen up there um, at Nappy, using it for power generation as well as for their equipment, and then using the CO2 offtake for potentially for greenhouse, uh, greenhouse crop growing. Then the Avangrid project is um, green hydrogen and ammonia to generate that here. And then the Libertad would be using electrolysis generation for generating local fuel. So those are three projects that are actually in the hydrogen project. Challenges for us, permitting these projects that we need, it's always a challenge to permit. Um, so kind of a request to, to, our, to the, the folks here that could have influence on that. We need public support. So one of the things Mike Hightower, I think, is doing an excellent job with uh, New Mexico Produce Water Consortium is really trying to engage public and talk about using produced water. If we can help get help engaging the public on the potential for hydrogen here, I think would be great. We need a railroad here. If I showed you a picture, we're like a big island. I think we're the largest uh, metropolitan area in the United States that doesn't have rail, and we need rail, especially if we're going to be continuing hydrogen, I mean uh, manufacturing here. Funding help for scaling up, up production to, to, to do technology conversion or uh, commercialization. Education and training for our workforce, the high schools, the, we've got great colleges as you're seeing demonstrated here today. And then finally, I think what I would like is to look to help to see if we can get direct funding to our economic development organization so that, that, that we can bring in additional people to help us um, develop these technologies and to help us grow our community uh, and our economy. So uh, I think that is that's my presentation. All right. So that's our first. So just think about questions you might have uh, in this area, especially since it's a very regional, again, another regional play and a lot of discussion around some of the challenges. So just think about some potential questions to ask. So. We're going to move on down to uh, Mike Hightower, uh, who's going to give a short discussion as well. So, Mike. Let's see. <coughs> Mom, you are. Okay. okay. So, uh, I'm going to follow up on some of the desal activities that I talked about this morning. And produced water is a type of uh, saline water that we find in the basin. And uh, as, as John mentioned, there's a lot of oil and gas production here in the San Juan Basin, Four Corners area. 
that I think can be utilized to move forward uh, in the transition of the energy systems. So what I wanted to show here is the fact that uh, we create a significant volume of produced water in the state of New Mexico. Um, currently it's, it's all injected underground, it's not reused. Um, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is we're looking at something on the order of uh, 200 to 250 million gallons a day produced water in the state of New Mexico. That's equivalent to the water consumed by, by five Albuquerque's. Uh, so it's, it's a huge amount of water that, that we're not using today. Um, one of the things that we're seeing with the injection of, of the produced water is induced seismicity, specifically in uh, the Permian Basin uh, of New Mexico. Not necessarily here, but uh, as we look at additional uh, infrastructure for ga natural gas in the future here for, with the tremendous resources, we're going to have to look at that also. So we have a huge amount of, of opportunities to use produced water uh, for beneficial uses, whether that's industrial or in energy, uh, agricultural. Uh, and I think as all of these are natural resources, and as we look at um, trying to, from a systems perspective, trying to minimize impacts on natural resources, we have to look at uh, how do we address food, how do we address air, how do we address water. And I think we can make, uh, if we're smart, we can use this non-traditional water resource to support food production, support uh, sustainability of, of freshwater resources, and provide us with opportunities for new energy sources. So those are the kind of areas I think that students today have a chance to, to operate in and participate in. And, and not in 10 years from now, I'm talking about in the next two to three years is when some of this will start. And John, I don't know if you shake your head yes or no, but it's, it's, it's not in a, a, a long way away, uh, not, not far, far away. This is, this is near term, uh, very close. So I wanted to, to mention just some of the treatment of produced water. Some of the produced water we have uh, in, in the Permian Basin is five times as salty as seawater, which means that's really difficult to treat. In the San Juan Basin, it is relatively low TDS, uh, low amounts of salts, much easier to treat. So the types of technologies that John's working on on, on membrane distillation systems are, are very, very uh, appropriate for the San Juan area which means that we have a lot of potential water supplies that can be utilized for industry, agriculture, et cetera. And our estimate is the number of water professionals that we're gonna to need to operate these water treatment systems and to reuse this water is on the order of 400 to 500 professionals uh, in the state of New Mexico. So these are technical jobs. These are jobs that are high paying jobs. So for the students in here, I think these are some huge opportunities. But I've got some pictures of produced water and how we can treat it and the fact that you know, we can get it to some very high qualities, which means that we can recover a lot of the oil uh, that we don't recover today without going back down hole and have water that's easy to treat from a desalination perspective. So I think those are things that uh, I think it would be very interesting as we move forward. The technologies have gotten uh, to the point where we can utilize this produced water for a lot of applications. So here's some applications that I think are important that we ought to look at. And as I mentioned, the natural resources, we ought to look at our national resources, natural resources and economic resources um, and uh, people resources kind of at a systems level. Uh, and so when you look at the state of New Mexico and this region as a system, there's a lot of benefits for the treatment of produced water, use of produced water, uh, not only from sustainability of freshwater resources, but opportunities to support uh, carbon sequestration to help on the energy side, um, opportunities to use that water for agricultural, for food, uh, um, approaches uh, to support the uh, NAPI, etc. Uh, there's, there's also the fact that we need to look at ourselves as, as a supporter of economic development for the country. And if you look at the, the recent study the, of the Roosevelt study, the state of New Mexico is kind of very unique position in the fact that much of the pipelines that carry natural gas to, Col uh, to California and the West Coast come through New Mexico. So if we can decarbonize natural gas with uh, hydrogen here, we can help the state of California, the state of Oregon, the state of Arizona, and Washington. Uh, we also sit in the only place in the country 
that all three electric grids come together in eastern New Mexico. So activities that we do in improving uh, uh, renewable energy supplies in, in New Mexico, and re renewable energy sources, we can provide energy security to the whole country, to all, all three grids, Texas. We don't, maybe we don't want to supply uh, power to Texas, but on the other two grids we can supply power to, um, and increase security and reliability. And the fact that we have a lot of natural gas, clean burning natural gas, so combined cycle natural gas uh, with uh, electric power from uh, renewables is probably a much cheaper and more effective uh, approach for long-term energy storage than batteries, uh, and it's all local, it's not important. So there's a lot of activities and opportunities here that we have uh, that are all new, but all support all of our natural resources uh, for, the, for the country, and we can be, uh, I think, a leader in the energy of the future and natural resource sustainability of the future here, and the students here are going to have opportunity to, to play a big role in that. So that's kind of my story, and I'll pass it on. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. So the next flash talk will be Tanya Gallegos from the, from the U.S. Geological Survey. We will pass you down the <laughs> necessary equipment. So go ahead and introduce yourself and go for it. There it is. Okay. Uh, my name is Tanya Gallegos. I'm the Associate Program Coordinator for the Mineral Resources Program at the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS. And for those of you who are not familiar with USGS, we're essentially um, the Scientific Bureau uh, for the um, Department of Interior. And so I work with a bunch of scientists, uh, geologists, chemists, geochemists, uh, and engineers, uh, all sorts of, uh, and biologists as well. And we study a variety of different science, or earth science topics. Uh, we study energy, uh, mineral resources, energy resources, water resources. We also study um, ecosystems, environmental health, hazards. So, you know, I joke sometimes that I do science fair for a living, and I love it. Um, and so, uh, before we um, get started, I really want to urge the students um, to ask us questions after after uh, after our break. Um, you know, also, if you just feel like giving us your perspective and raising your hand and commenting on something we say, we're, we're here just as much to learn as you are. And so we're really interested in learning about your perspectives as well. So let's talk about critical minerals. Okay, you may have heard a lot about critical minerals recently in the news. Well, critical minerals are really important uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, critical minerals are used in defense applications. They're also used in uh, advanced technologies like our cell phones. And so um, relative or relevant to what we're talking about today, they're also really essential for renewable energy and also energy storage. And so critical minerals are used to make batteries that, that are used in um, electric vehicles, but also to store any energy that's generated from renewable energy sources. They're also critical for just constructing these solar cells as well as the wind turbines. So they're very important um, to this transition to green energy. And one of the other things that makes these minerals critical is the fact that many of these minerals are not currently mined in the United States um, to a large extent. Um, and so we're reliant on foreign countries to supply us with those minerals. And so this could be an issue, especially if we're sourcing those minerals from some countries that may not be so friendly. So for example, in 2022, the United States was 100% reliant um, for 15 minerals. And so this is um, a little bit of an issue. And so the federal government, the United States government has been aware of this issue for some time. And so um, back in 2022, the Energy Act passed by Congress, um, I'm sorry, 2020 Energy Act, uh, directed the USGS to come up with a critical minerals list. And so this is a list of, of 50 critical minerals. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out is that this list would actually be very different than what we would see, let's say, 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. And you can imagine why. Well, we didn't have cell phones 50 years ago, and our technologies are constantly changing. So you can imagine that in 20 or 40 or 50 years, this list will be different. And so also our relationships with these different countries are gonna change over time. So things change and you know, that's important to keep in mind is that this, this list will also change over time. 
Okay, so you might be wondering, well, where can we find these critical minerals in the United States? And so this is one of the things we're trying to de do at USGS. We're trying to identify areas that are most likely to contain critical minerals. And so we have an initiative called the uh, Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, where we're trying to create maps of where we'll most likely see critical minerals. And so um, these maps are, the, the map I show here is actually a map of uh, some mineral systems that are most likely to host critical minerals. And this is going to really guide our data collection because we really need more data to better identify where we might be able to find some of these minerals. And so, for example, we're going to be collecting data in the New Mexico and Arizona porphyry belts. We're also collecting data in the indium, zinc, copper, scarn deposits in Utah. We're also looking at collecting data um, that could um, potentially be a host for or, or of areas that could be host for rare earth and thorium uh, um, resources in the wet mountains in Colorado. So we're really collecting a lot of data in the Four Corners region. And so um, this will also provide data that we can actually use to assess where we might be able to find uh, critical minerals in the future. And so critical minerals are essentially naturally occurring deposits. So essentially high concentrations of deposits occur either in, in in the Earth's crust, either at the surface or below below ground. So that means they're going to have to be mined at some point. Um, and so what we're finding with these mineral systems, though, is that oftentimes these critical minerals occur in smaller concentrations rather than re relative to, um, let's say, a, a, a mineral that might occur in higher concentrations and would be targeted by mining companies. And that's important because then we can recover them as byproducts in mining processes. And so what I show here is the periodic table. And in red, we have shaded uh, the critical minerals that are most likely uh, occurring uh, alongside these uh, primary deposits. And so um, this is important for both historical mining operations as well as current and future mining operations. So when you think about it, let's say copper. If a copper miner comes in and wants to develop a copper deposit, so they mine out all the, all the ore and they they send to the treatment plant the ore that contains the highest concentrations of copper. And guess what happens to the, the, the rest of the rock? They throw it into the waste pile. And that's what happened historically. And so this actually presents a really great opportunity on, on two fronts. First of all, we might have a lot of critical minerals available in those waste piles that are found at these abandoned mine sites all over the United States. The second thing is this will compel the mining companies to maybe add in a different circuit to their mining operations and, and, and basically um, extract the critical minerals now because we know it has value. And that will ultimately lessen the waste burden on the environment. And so we really have to start thinking about things in a different way. Think about things in more of the life cycle. We have to think about the prospect of, you know, what if we didn't have to have waste? What if we can put all that uh, ore that's mined to a beneficial reuse? And so that's one of the ways we're starting to think about um, some of these mining operations. And so here I show a map, and this is a map of all the mine features that we've identified. So these are essentially at abandoned mine sites across the United States. And so in the Four Corners, we have about 130,000 mine features, mine-related features, that are currently on the landscape. And about 2,400 of those mine features are waste-related features. So if there's a possibility that some of those mine features like waste piles and tailings piles contain critical minerals, we can actually extract the critical minerals possibly. And that, that uh, extraction could actually offset potentially some of the reclamation costs. And so that may promote reclamation, further reclamation of some of these abandoned mine sites. And so what we're trying to do at USGS is we're trying to actually take an inventory of all those um, abandoned, mine, uh, abandoned waste piles and so we're actually working with the state geological surveys um, to go out and characterize some of these sites. And so here I show a picture of some of my colleagues working with the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and um, Mineral Resources. And so what they're doing is they're collecting water samples as well as waste rock samples, um, mine waste rock samples. And so they're gonna take them, send them back to the lab and characterize them so we can figure out uh, if there are critical minerals in these mine waste piles and figure out how much is there. And so uh, one last uh, topic I wanted to cover very briefly is water. And so 
as I mentioned, um, these deposits, these uh, critical mineral deposits will have to be mined in the future. And so we just don't have enough of these critical minerals in circulation in the economy um, to meet our needs even through recycling. And so at least for the short term, we're gonna have to uh, mine some of these uh, uh, critical mineral deposits. And water plays a very important role. Water can either be used through, uh, by the mining companies um, for, for things like drilling, or water can actually be produced. And when uh, water sometimes is pumped out of the uh, deposit so that they can access the deposit. And so, you know, we all know that there's a history of mining in this area, and it has resulted in um, impacts to both water quantities as well as water quality. And so the, what we've learned, though, from all these mining operations in the past is that the extent to which the, um, our, our drinking water and our surface water and groundwater are impacted really is a function of a couple of different factors. First, where's that deposit? What kind of de deposit is it? How deep is it? What other elements are present? And also, where is it located? Is it located in aquifers? Is it located close to water bodies? And then the other aspect is that um, it, it really depends on the type of mining method. Is it going to be an in-situ recovery mining operation? Is it going to be a surface mining? Is it going to be underground mining? And one of the most important aspects is actually how is this mine designed? And what is, how is it managed? What are we doing with that water uh, that, we, um, that we pump out? Um, that we're using and drilling? Are we, are we making an effort to try to reuse that water? So I think these are um, uh, uh, things that we should think about when future mining occurs. You know, we don't have to do things the way we did it in the past. Many of the mining operations that took place historically were done in the absence of any environmental regulations because we didn't have things like the Clean Water Act. And so we have to challenge um, you know, mining companies that come in, managers, um, you know, people who are overseeing these operations to really think a little bit differently about both the mine waste as well as the wastewater, to think about how we can um, achieve beneficial reuse of these wastes. And with that, I will go ahead and uh, leave you with my contact information. And again, students, please ask questions uh, after the break. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Now we're getting applause. Okay. <laughs> it's going to turn into a contest. No, I'm just kidding. I'll pay you guys later. Yeah. <laughs> so, so next up is Dr. John Leeper from WSP, and uh, I will turn it over to him to introduce himself. And okay. Do you have the thing here? Um, is it okay if I use this thing? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, it's after lunch. Um, so. How do we do this? Extra slides? Where are they? Are they going backwards? Mm -hmm. Sorry, those are my head. I think you go forward, those are my head. Oh, you have extra slides. Oh, okay, here we go. So, I was thinking about the 50 year water plan. The state is working on a 50 year water plan. And I've worked on water plans, and I've worked on water plans with a lot of folks in this room. And you know what? I'm not going to be here in 50 years to see how it turns out. And I was just bummed out about that. Is it going to be just? Is it going to be equitable? Is it going to be sustainable? But you know what? You guys will be. You will be here. You're going to inherit this 50-year water plan to make sure it's all of those things. It has to be those things. So let me start here. Does anybody recognize what that's a picture of? California condor. Now, when I was in school, I won't say how long ago, there was a couple dozen of those birds left in the wild. And everyone had lead poisoning. And they were on the way to extinction. It was a matter of years. Today, there's over 500 in the wild. You can go to the Grand Canyon today and see those things. In 50 years, you and your kids will see those birds. They're going to be here for you. They haven't gone extinct. OK, a little closer to home. Does anybody recognize what that fish is? Trout. Almost. Colorado pike minnow. What? Would you stand up, please? It's OK. 
The pike minnow was bigger than this young lady. It was a, you can sit down now. It was an amazing, amazing fish. What happened to it? We built a bunch of dams in the Colorado River Basin. We destroyed most of its habitat. We built Navajo Dam in the 1960s. And then we wrote on the river to get rid of the trash fish. This is an endangered species. Well, after decades and over $100 million, there are breeding populations of the pike minnow in the Colorado Basin. And it's been reestablished in the San Juan River. So that means when we're thinking about our 50-year water plan, in 50 years, you guys and your kids will still have Colorado pike minnow around. Okay, anybody recognize that one? That is our state amphibian. <laughs> you didn't know? We, it's a spade-footed toad. Yes, we have a, we've got a state smell now, we have a state amphibian. <laughs> now, there are places it's a threatened and endangered species. In New Mexico, its populations are declining. Now, I'm from Socorro right now, living in Socorro, spent a lot of time in Gallup and other places. But after a big monsoon shower, you hear these guys singing and singing and singing and singing away. They're in decline. The number of events that trigger that are less frequent and less frequent and less frequent. Socorro has lost. 30% of its irrigated farmland in the last 20 years. So when I'm talking about a 50-year water plan, this is the plan, is it going to be just? Is it going to be equitable? Is it going to be sustainable? Will we see this toad left? Or will it be gone? This is what you guys, you're the nexus. You are the energy water nexus. You guys already have the interests and the skills to tackle these problems. Don't let skill, don't let school, don't let TikTok, don't let Facebook destroy that interest or that skill. TikTok is great if you're learning the new dance moves. You know, Facebook is great if there's aftershave that smells good and the women like it. Don't let those Androids, don't let those iPhones kill your interest or kill your skills. Nobody gets a pass. This stuff is urgent, and you guys are inheriting it. So let me give you a couple extra thoughts. Who here is going to do transformative things? And I'm not going to show a hand, but think about it. No one gets a pass. Now you may be thinking, well, oh, I'm no good at math, or whatever. The fact you guys here means a lot. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have those interests. So we don't know. Some folks have all A's, some don't. Some are tall, some are short. Um, some have just different interests. We don't know who is going to write the next song that's going to inspire a generation. We don't know who may be writing for the Denver Post. We don't know who may be a biologist turning algae into something that sequesters carbon and produces fuel for trucks. We don't know who's going to be a civil engineer. God bless the civil engineers. I hope we have some civil engineers. Civil engineers solve a lot of problems, but they also have a tendency to create problems. But uh, hopefully they solve more than they may create. So God bless the civil engineers. So we don't know who's going to do those transformative things. No one here is going to get a pass. No one here can say, oh, well, Math is too hard. You all can learn the skills you need, the math you need, the leadership skills you need. If you're on a family farm, find ways to figure out regenerative agriculture so you're sequestering carbon. If whatever your background is, it's needed. So guess what? You all get a homework assignment, okay? I would predict by the time all of us get to dinner tonight, we are going to forget 80% of what was said here today. That's on the low side. And I'm not blaming you guys. I think it's true of all of us. But I want you guys, when you go home, 
use that TikTok, use that Facebook, use whatever tool it is to find a way to connect your current skills and your current interests with these kinds of problems. We have Trees New Mexico, we have Covera Coalition, we have Engineers Without Borders, we have, I'm on the board of the Rio Grande Ag Land Trust. I mean, there's no shortage of ways you can get connected. None. So what you're going to do is you're going to find a way to get connected to these things. No one gets a pass. And then you're all going to be back here in a year, and you're all going to be writing papers or do posters on how you connected the skills you have, the interests you have, with these kind of problems. Okay? Everyone's going to get connected. Nobody's going to get a pass. Okay? We'll see you in a year. <laughs>
So this message is for students. When you pursue a degree, keep in mind that many of the skills that you're going to learn in the classroom are going to be transferable skills. They're going to be able to lead you into different career opportunities. You don't have to stay in that field. You have many, many opportunities. Uh, before, uh, yesterday I was looking at the, our degrees and trying to do a crosswalk with some of the occupations that are listed in several of the major, uh, in one of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Indeed, and some of the other uh, job uh, uh, banks. And many, many jobs uh, required the foundation that you could obtain from the previous uh, uh, educational uh, certificate programs that I listed a few minutes ago. Now, some of these occupations are going to require you to not only to complete a certificate, to complete an associate degree, but also think about the future. Think about pursuing a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and in some cases, some of these will require a, a doctoral degree. For some of us, when we came to school, when we pursued a degree, we had to take steps. I myself completed an associate's degree at a community college. I'm a product of a community college. Then after that, I had to work. After completing several years of work, I had the opportunity to go back and pursue a bachelor's degree. Went to work. After completing a bachelor's, uh, you know, after completing a few years working, I went back and pursued a master's degree. Went to work again. There were some other, other opportunities. Came back and pursued a doctoral degree. So it's very possible. And again, the education that you're gaining at a community college is setting the foundation for your future success. As I mentioned, some of these careers are going to require you to have a bachelor's degree. <coughs> and here's a one college we're very fortunate. We have uh, crafted an agreement and developed several articulation agreements with several of our partner universities for your universities to allow our students to pursue a seamless transition from an associate's degree to a bachelor's degree and therefore have the opportunities to pursue a master's degree. I was looking at some of the occupations, just so you'll know that, uh, you know, looking at the openings, and even without the opportunities that these new conversations and the new uh, uh, fields are going to provide, there's already many openings in our community that are offer good paying jobs in the field of energy or water and they're constantly, employers are constantly looking for qualified and skilled workers. This chart shows you the, some of the uh, top employers are looking for people who have some of the background in those two fields. And then as you can see some of the uh, postings just recently, or, or I think it was just, just over the last six months. Now, this is something that we all need to keep in mind especially for those of us uh, who, who work in education. This is what employers are looking for. Employers are looking for you to have the right skills, the right technical skills, but they're looking for more than that. They're looking for individuals who have communication skills, who have management skills, operational skills, planning skills, leadership skills, customer service skills, and let me tell you, one of the most frequent asked uh, skills that employers are looking for, they're looking for people who can work with others. How surprising. <laughs> okay. There are some, some areas, and in fact, we work with employers on a regular basis, and they will, they will tell you they have very, very talented individuals, very skilled individuals, but for God, they cannot communicate and they cannot work with other people. So these are very necessary, very, very important skills for all of us to understand that is they need to be part, first of all for us in, in academia, to make sure they're part of the curriculum, part of the competencies that we need to make sure that we impart in the classroom, but also for us as individuals to know that that's something that our employers and the people that work, we work with are looking for. These are the top specialized skills 
that employers are looking for, especially if you work in the areas of energy or water. Biology, computer science, data analysis, equipment maintenance, and so on. And the last year that I want to uh, also uh, some of the softer skills that employers are looking for. Microsoft Office, Excel, SQL programming, and some of the basics of uh, software, uh, software solutions. Again, I, you know, my presentation is not, it did go into the technical aspects, but nonetheless, it's, I believe, is one of the most important aspects of how a community can be successful. No business will be successful without the right employees, with the right skills, with the right willingness to, to learn and to grow professionally. Here's some more colleges I mentioned. We're very fortunate. We have visionaries who are at the forefront having those conversations. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Pendergast and, and uh, Ms. Alicia Corbell are part of our an ongoing conversation as to how to uh, revamp, how to uh, improve our uh, curriculum, how to identify opportunities, and especially more importantly, how to identify emerging occupations that are going to come as a result of this energy transition. I can assure you that right now, there are many occupations, there, there will be many occupations there, there, you, we don't have a job title or a job description anywhere. This is an emergent uh, opportunity for our communities, but again, the other place is going to be very critical. We need to ensure that we have a, that we open opportunities for disadvantaged communities. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo. That was, that was very good. Uh, I really appreciate that. And, you know, just seeing some of the diversity things uh, from all aspects, I think, is really, really critical. And, and I think uh, it's greatly appreciated your remarks. So, our final panelist today, before we go into questions, a break in questions, is uh, you heard from her this morning a little bit, and you're going to hear a little bit more from her, is uh, Dr. Crystal Tully Cordova from the Navajo Nation. So, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So this morning I had described uh, the Colorado River Basin and I guess one of the reasons why I concentrate on that is because of the water, the water um, energy water nexus and the need for water on the San Juan River Basin, um, which is connected to the larger Colorado River Basin. And so this is the map of the Colorado River Basin and what you can see is that it does extend into Mexico and you can see the number of states that it covers and then you can also see the tribal lands and it's important to consider I mean well the proximity of these tribal lands to the river but I think you know one of the most frustrating things for me as a hydrologist is really people's um, segregated understanding of different components of the water cycle and as the net people, we know that all the water is connected. Um, and so, you know, when I grew up, I was always encouraged to consider um, the interconnectedness of water. So like when it rains or when it snows, you know, those contributions go to ephemeral streams that flow intermittently or perennial streams, those that flow year round and then the recharge to groundwater. But then when you also think about it, I think one of the important things to consider as well is going back to when we were in fourth grade and fifth grade, learning about the water cycle, about water in the gas phase. And so things like evapotranspiration really contribute to the system as well. And why do I bring that up? I bring that up because when we talk about water, it's all aspects of water that we consider um, with regards to, you know, the current state of the situation um, and then our ability to be able to use the water. So I don't know if many of you know, like there are many components of the water cycle. There are also many uses of water within this region and just speaking generally throughout the world. And so those uses can include municipal, domestic, industrial, commercial, livestock, agricultural uses, cultural uses of water, and 
So with regards to the Colorado River Basin, one of the interesting things to note as well is the way something is managed. And I had alluded to that earlier in describing the policy. So this system isn't managed the way it's drawn, the outer boundary is drawn across you know, Mexico and the United States. Um, it's truncated, and it's truncated into two pieces, and those two pieces are the upper and the lower Colorado River Basin. And when you think about that, it's important to consider like where is the water located and where is it going and how much needs to be delivered from the upper basin to the lower basin and why does that matter especially with regards to tribes um, there are projects like the central arizona project i don't know if you've ever been to phoenix arizona and you've seen line canals that are there um, that's a result of a Bureau of Reclamation project that brought water into that region. When you see um, some of the maps earlier, you know it said groundwater was pretty limited in those areas and it was pretty, pretty much red because there was not a lot of water available. Uh, water levels have dropped in those regions where there's significant populations. Um, but now proceeding on, so the, well, I guess one more point to note, Navajo Nation straddles the upper and the lower Colorado River Basin. And if you didn't know, Navajo Nation also has land in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, and we also have a ranch in Colorado. And so when you think about that, and you think about how policies um, operate a system, you think about transboundary issues. Uh, so Navajo Nation definitely has its share of that as well as other tribes too. So we have in this region, uh, Southern Ute has their headquarters in Ignacio, and Ute Mountain Ute Tribe has their headquarters in Towak. And when you think about where their lands are, um, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe has land in both New Mexico and Colorado and Utah. Um, so just to give an example of that. And then there are some tribes that may be federally recognized, but don't have a land base. And those, that tribe is um, the San Juan Southern Paiute. And then there's also uh, Hickoria Apache Nation as well. And they rely on water in the San Juan River. And here is a teacup diagram of the upper Colorado River Basin, which, you know, Four Corners region is primarily in the upper Colorado River Basin. So it's important to have an understanding of how these reservoirs are operated. Some reservoirs generate hydropower, um, others just hold water for the most part. And so you can see Lake Powell, it's the largest teacup, but it's also the one that's one of the more empty ones. Um, so why do I show you this? Because as I mentioned, and probably in the media, you've already seen uh, lowering levels in Lake Powell. And so what's being done to be able to protect that and what's being done are so I mentioned earlier in my presentation today that you know things are far worse than they could ever they were ever thought to be back in the early 2000s so black swan event um, for sure with hydrology and as such there are different approaches that have been done to be able to help the crisis at hand and that includes, so the 2007 and the interim guidelines is what operates the reservoirs in the Colorado River Basin. Um, and then to help with the challenge was the authorization of the drought contingency plan. In the upper basin, that drought contingency plan also, also authorized the opportunity for a drought response operations agreement. So what does that mean? It means that their upper basin reservoirs could release levels that can help with elevation levels um, to help keep up the reservoir elevation level at Powell. And so those three reservoirs are Flaming Gorge, Blue Mesa, and Navajo Reservoir. And Navajo Reservoir, if you've ever been there, it's just up along the way here from Farmington, or if you've ever driven down from uh, Durango, you can see it. But it's important for various aspects in this region. I mean, one, it contributes to um, we have an intake, Navajo Indian Irrigation Project. We're concerned of reservoir elevation levels at, at Navajo Reservoir, because if it drops below 5,990, 
then we don't have an opportunity to be able to use the intake to access our water. And so when there are recommendations to like basically take water from other reservoirs to help with reservoirs like Lake Pell, that, that's a challenge for some people. That's also a challenge because Hickorya also has storage rights um, in Navajo as well. But one of the unique things about Hickorya is they didn't have the, the opportunity to really use that water. And so they put it into the New Mexico, the state of New Mexico Strategic Water Reserve in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. So it's kind of one of those opportunities to plan for un an unforeseeable future. Um, but with this unprecedented uh, precipitation that we've received with the monsoon precipitation as well as the winter precipitation, it's helpful because now for this year at least, we have the opportunity to try to recover water at these reservoirs. Um, so in planning for future water use. So just describing um, that the drought response operations agreement, I mentioned previously the 1922 compact didn't have tribes as signatory or <coughs> representatives from Mexico. But what are we doing to try to address those issues? And this section 7.2 is something that tribes worked on uh, collaboratively together to come up with that language. We work with the different state entities to be able to give us feedback because for this type of language to be included into a formal document that would be later signed by the Secretary of Interior, um, it has to be approved by the Upper Colorado River Commission. And so after that, we met with the Department of Interior solicitor as well to be able to see like, hey, can you give us feedback on this language? Like, Literally, when I'm a scientist and words don't mean as much to me as what it means to an attorney, because I mean, two words that can be really similar are completely different in, uh, to an attorney. And so with that being said, this provided an opportunity. Um, previously, a decision was made and then the tribes were told after the fact. And I mean, that's a challenge, right? When you're relying on that water in Navajo Reservoir and you're told that emergency releases could happen or drought response operations agreement releases could happen. Um, and that was a challenge for tribes that were interested in not only the storage, but also the in-stream flow of the San Juan River. And so with that being said, that got passed. It was passed by the Upper Colorado River Commission. It was signed um, by the Secretary of the Interior and so that, that provides an opportunity, right? Like one of the things you want to try to do sometimes in when there's not equity in some of these management practices is completely, you know, go 180. But unfortunately, with the way policies are written in this country, there's, there's a step in the right direction. And this is one of those step in the right directions. So the water that we use, why do we, why do we want to use it? Um, there are economic opportunities and tribes that are reliant on that water for these economic opportunities. So these are um, Ute Mountain Ute tribes, Southern Ute tribe, different um, crops are grown at these different farms. Here's an example as well of the um, Navajo Indian Irrigation Project. And it was a project that was authorized under that public law 87483 but wasn't completely funded and continu continues to still struggle to be funded to be able to develop um, the blocks 10 and 11. And when we think about uh, that, we also think about you know the energy aspect of what are some of the priorities for tribes. And the other priorities for tribe also include just, um, I guess when, at least I can speak for Navajo, when we present our priorities, like with regards to the way a system is managed, we don't say like our number one priority is this. Um, we essentially put all of them out and say these are our priorities and these are our concerns. Because as previously alluded to, you transfer water with energy and you create energy with water. So there's this interconnectedness that you can't put one above the other. They're both equally important, um, as well as I also encourage us to think about that food, energy, water nexus. I mean, 
as we had lunch today, I don't think we would have been able to stay up as long as we have right now if we didn't have lunch. And so it's really important to consider that aspect as well when we think about the priorities. And the priorities that tribes have, they may sometimes be different than other water rights holders because they may be more broad. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, the Imperial Irrigation District has uh, a limited wa water uses as compared to tribes. But when we think about tribes uh, in this region, it's really varied water uses that we are concerned about and their interconnectedness with food as well as energy. And so this is a picture of Glen Canyon Dam and then the Colorado River Storage Project region. I think it's just important to note that there's, there's thousands of people that depend on the Colorado River Storage Project and so just as that water declines, uh, it's important to have an understanding of what that may mean as well for the future. Thank you, Crystal. That was really that was, that was a great talk. So we're here for a break now. So we're going to give you we're, we're a few minutes behind, but we're going to go ahead and give you about ten minutes or so. We're going to convene back here at uh, at ten till three. And again, to the students, your charge, and you've heard a lot of charges to you guys today, so we want to hear from you with some questions. I'll tee up a couple of questions when we get off break, and then, but I really want to hear from the students your perspectives and your questions for the panelists. So let's take a quick break.